Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the December 2023 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of the statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties meeting in Moscow, USSR from 1960. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon. Or buy me a coffee at patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. There are links to Patreon and buy me a coffee in the video description. So this piece is another installment in a brief series that we're doing right now on the channel about the Sino-Soviet split. After the death of Stalin from the mid-1950s to 1960s, a political rift formed between the USSR and Maoist China. It started off fairly small and then grew in significance, getting pretty escalated. Among the countries siding with Maoist China in that split was Albania, headed by Enver Hoxha. We have a reading coming up from Hoxha, which is about Palestine. It's called Palestine Belongs to Palestinians. We have just a few more readings to go before we get into that one, but the reason why I'm doing some background is that Hoxha speaks extensively in that, and that was written basically in the 1970s, about the Soviet revisionists. And if you're not familiar with the history of the split, you're not going to really know what he's talking about. So this particular piece, the Statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties from 1960, is referenced in the most recent Hoxha speech that we put up, which is titled Reject the Revisionist Theses of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Basically, this is the statement that was being developed at the meeting where Hoxha gave that speech. It's also a three-year update of a 1957 document, which is the most recent audiobook that we published, which was the Declaration of Communist and Workers' Parties of the Socialist Countries, basically a sort of State of the Union address as far as the construction of socialism was concerned. Keep in mind that this was after the Comintern or Communist International had been dissolved, and this was sort of an attempt maybe to get it going again, however it really didn't get off the ground. At least not fully, and that was due in large part to the split between the USSR and China. We have two more works coming up on this topic, which are Mao's Khrushchev's Phony Communism and Hoxha's The Demagogy of the Soviet Revisionists. Those will be posted in a few days. Then we'll do the Hoxha on Palestine piece, and we will proceed from there. But for now, let's get into this one. The source is Statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties, Meeting in Moscow, USSR, 1960, published in New York by New Century Publishers, 1961, and the HTML transcription and markup was done by Juan Fajardo for Marxists.org, April 2010, thanks as usual to MIA, the Marxist Center Net Archive, for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. So we begin with a note to the readers. This pamphlet contains the complete and authorized text of the statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties which met in Moscow, USSR, in November 1960. The statement which was issued on December 5, created a world stir and was widely discussed in the press and radio. In the USA, however, only the New York Times printed the statement in full, although in a crude and unauthorized translation, which contained many errors. The present text is reprinted from the January 1961 issue of the Marxist Monthly Political Affairs, and it's published in pamphlet form as a public service because of the wide and intense interest in its analysis of the present world situation and the perspectives for the future. And there's another editor's note. Representatives of 81 communist and workers' parties consulted together for an extended period of time in November 1960. On December 5, 1960, these parties unanimously adopted a statement. This historic document is printed in full in the following pages in an authorized translation. Representatives of the communist and workers' parties have discussed at this meeting urgent problems of the present international situation and the further struggle for peace, national independence, democracy, and socialism. The meeting has shown unity of views among the participants on the issues discussed. The communist and workers' parties have unanimously reaffirmed their allegiance to the Declaration and Peace Manifesto adopted in 1957. These program documents of creative Marxism-Leninism determine the fundamental positions of the international communist movement on the more important issues of our time, and contributed in great measure toward uniting the efforts of the communist and workers' parties in the struggle to achieve common goals. They remain the banner and guide to action for the whole of the international communist movement. The course of events in the past three years has demonstrated the correctness of the analysis of the international situation and the outlook for world development as given in the Declaration and Peace Manifesto, and the great scientific force and effective role of creative Marxism-Leninism. 
The chief result of these years is the rapid growth of the might and international influence of the world socialist system. The vigorous process of disintegration of the colonial system under the impact of the national liberation movement, the intensification of class struggles in the capitalist world, and the continued decline and decay of the world capitalist system. The superiority of the forces of socialism over those of imperialism, of the forces of peace over those of war, is becoming ever more marked in the world arena. Nevertheless, imperialism, which is intent on maintaining its positions, sabotages disarmament, seeks to prolong the Cold War and aggravate it to the utmost, and persists in preparing a new world war. This situation demands ever closer joint efforts and resolute actions on the part of the socialist countries, the international working class, the national anti-imperialist movement, all peace-loving countries, and all peace champions, to prevent war and assure a peaceful life for people. It demands the further consolidation of all revolutionary forces in the fight against imperialism, for national independence, and for socialism. Section 1. Our Time, whose main content is the transition from capitalism to socialism, initiated by the Great October Socialist Revolution, is a time of struggle between the two opposing social systems, a time of socialist revolutions and national liberation revolutions, a time of the breakdown of imperialism, of the abolition of the colonial system, a time of transition of more peoples to the socialist path, of the triumph of socialism and communism on a worldwide scale. It is the principal characteristic of our time that the world socialist system is becoming the decisive factor in the development of society. The strength and invincibility of socialism have been demonstrated in recent decades in titanic battles between the new and old worlds. Attempts by the imperialists and their shock force, fascism, to check the course of historical development by force of arms ended in failure. Imperialism proved powerless to stop the socialist revolutions in Europe and Asia. Socialism became a world system. The imperialists tried to hamper the economic progress of the socialist countries, but their schemes were foiled. The imperialists did all in their power to preserve the system of colonial slavery, but that system is falling apart. As the world socialist system grows stronger, the international situation changes more and more in favor of the peoples fighting for independence, democracy, and social progress. Today, it is the world socialist system and the forces fighting against imperialism for a socialist transformation of society that determine the main content, main trend, and main features of the historical development of society. Whatever efforts imperialism makes, it cannot stop the advance of history. A reliable basis has been provided for further decisive victories for socialism. The complete triumph of socialism is inevitable. The course of social development proves right Lenin's prediction that the countries of victorious socialism would influence the development of world revolution, chiefly by their economic construction. Socialism has made unprecedented constructive progress in production, science, and technology, and in the establishment of a new, free community of people, in which their material and spiritual requirements are increasingly satisfied. The time is not far off when socialism's share of world production will be greater than that of capitalism. Capitalism will be defeated in the decisive sphere of human endeavor, the sphere of material production. The consolidation and development of the socialist system exert an ever-increasing influence on the struggle of the peoples in the capitalist countries. By the force of its example, the world socialist system is revolutionizing the thinking of the working people in the capitalist countries. It is inspiring them to fight against capitalism, and it is greatly facilitating that fight. In the capitalist countries, the forces fighting for peace and national independence and for the triumph of democracy and the victory of socialism are gaining in numbers and strength. The world capitalist system is going through an intense process of disintegration and decay. Its contradictions have accelerated the development of monopoly capitalism into state monopoly capitalism. By tightening the monopoly's grip on the life of the nation, state monopoly capitalism closely combines the power of the monopolies with that of the state, with the aim of saving the capitalist system and increasing the profits of the imperialist bourgeoisie to the utmost by exploiting the working class and plundering large sections of the population. But no matter what methods it resorts to, the monopoly bourgeoisie cannot rescue capitalism. The interests of a handful of monopolies are in irreconcilable contradiction to the interests of the entire nation. The class and national antagonisms, and the internal and external contradictions of capitalist society, have sharpened greatly. Attempts to prop the decayed pillars of capitalism by militarism are aggravating these contradictions still further. Never has the conflict between the productive forces and relations of production in the capitalist countries been so acute. 
Capitalism impedes more and more the use of the achievements of modern science and technology in the interests of social progress. It turns the discoveries of human genius against mankind itself by converting them into formidable means of destructive warfare. The instability of capitalist economy is growing, although production in some capitalist countries is increasing to some degree or other. The contradictions of capitalism are becoming more acute on a national as well as international scale. Some capitalist countries are faced with the threat of new economic upheavals while still grappling with the consequences of the recent economic crisis. The anarchical nature of capitalist production is becoming more marked. Capitalist concentration is assuming unprecedented dimensions, and monopoly profits and super profits are growing. Monopoly capital has greatly intensified the exploitation of the working class in new forms, above all through intensification of labor. Automation and, quote, rationalization under capitalism bring the working people further calamities. Only by a stubborn struggle has the working class, in some countries, succeeded in winning a number of its pressing demands. In many capitalist countries, however, the standard of life is still below pre-war. Despite the promises made by the bourgeoisie, full employment was provided only in some of the capitalist countries, and only temporarily. The domination of the monopolies is causing increasing harm to the interests of the broad peasant masses and large sections of the small and middle bourgeoisie. In the capitalist countries, including some of the more developed, economically underdeveloped areas still exist where the poverty of the masses is appalling, and these, moreover, continue to expand. These facts once again refute the lies which bourgeois ideologists and revisionists spread to the effect that modern capitalism has become, quote, people's capitalism that it has established a so-called welfare state, capable of overcoming the anarchy of production and economic crisis and assuring well-being for all working people. The uneven course of development of capitalism is continuously changing the balance of forces between the imperialist countries. The narrower the sphere of imperialist domination, the stronger the antagonisms between the imperialist powers. The problem of markets has become more acute than ever. The new interstate organizations, which are established under the slogan of integration, actually lead to increased antagonisms and struggle between the imperialist countries. They are new forms of division of the world capitalist market among the biggest capitalist combines, of penetration by stronger imperialist states, of the economy of their weaker partners. The decay of capitalism is particularly marked in the United States of America, the chief imperialist country of today. U.S. monopoly capital is clearly unable to use all the productive forces at its command. The richest of the developed capitalist countries of the world, the United States of America, has become a land of especially big chronic unemployment. Increasing undercapacity operation in industry has become permanent in that country. Despite the enormous increase in military appropriations, which is achieved at the expense of the standard of life of the working people, the rate of growth of production has been declining in the post-war years and has barely been above the growth of population. Overproduction crises have become more frequent. The most developed capitalist country has become a country of the most distorted, militarized economy. More than any other capitalist country, the United States drains Asia, and especially Latin America, of their riches, holding up their progress. U.S. capitalist penetration into Africa is increasing. U.S. imperialism has become the biggest international exploiter. The U.S. imperialists seek to bring many states under their control by resorting chiefly to the policy of military blocks and economic, quote, aid. They violate the sovereignty of developed capitalist countries as well. The dominant monopoly bourgeoisie in the more developed capitalist countries, which has allied itself with U.S. imperialism, sacrifices the sovereignty of their countries, hoping, with support from the U.S. imperialists, to crush the revolutionary liberation forces, deprive the working people of democratic freedoms, and impede the struggle of the masses for social progress. U.S. imperialism involves those countries in the arms race, in a policy of preparing a new war of aggression and carrying on subversive activities against socialist and neutral countries. The pillars of the capitalist system have become so decayed that the ruling imperialist bourgeoisie in many countries can no longer resist on its own the forces of democracy and progress, which are gaining in scope and strength. The imperialists form military political alliances under U.S. leadership to fight in common against the socialist camp and to strangle the national liberation, working class, and socialist movements. International developments in recent years have furnished many new proofs of the fact that U.S. imperialism is the chief bulwark of world reaction and an international gendarme, that it has become an enemy of the peoples of the whole world. The system of military blocs set up by the United States is being weakened both by the struggle going on between their members 
and as a result of the struggle which the people are waging for the abolition of these blocks, the U.S. imperialists seek to strengthen aggressive blocks, which causes increased resistance on the part of the people. The United States remains the main economic, financial, and military force of modern imperialism, although its share in capitalist economy is diminishing. The British and French imperialists are making stubborn efforts to uphold their positions. The monopolies of West Germany and Japan, which have recovered their might, which are closely linked with the U.S. monopolies, are stepping up expansion. The West German monopolies, in pursuing their imperialist policy, seek more and more to exploit the underdeveloped countries. The peoples are rising with growing determination to fight imperialism. A great struggle is getting underway between the forces of labor and capital, of democracy and reaction, of freedom and colonialism. The victory of the popular revolution in Cuba has become a splendid example for the peoples of Latin America. An anti-colonial movement for freedom and national independence is expanding irresistibly in Africa. The anti-imperialist national uprising in Iraq has been crowned with success. A powerful movement of the people against the Japanese-U.S. military alliance for peace, democracy, and national independence is underway in Japan. Vigorous actions by the masses in Italy in defense of democracy show the militant resolve of the working people. The struggle for democracy against the reactionary regime of personal power is gathering momentum in France. There have been big working-class strikes in the USA, Argentina, Uruguay, Chile, India, Britain, Canada, Belgium, and other capitalist countries. The actions of the Negro people in the United States for their fundamental rights are assuming a mass character. There is a growing desire to unite the national forces against the fascist dictatorships in Spain and Portugal, and the democratic movement is gaining strength in Greece. Tyrannical military regimes have been overthrown in Colombia and Venezuela. A blow has been dealt to frankly pro-American puppet governments in South Korea and Turkey. A national democratic movement, directed against the U.S. imperialists and their flunkies, is developing in South Vietnam and Laos. The Indonesian people are doing away with the economic positions the imperialists still retain in that country, particularly the positions held by the Dutch colonialists. The mass movement in defense of peace is gaining ground in all continents. All this is graphic evidence that the tide of anti-imperialist, national liberation, anti-war, and class struggles is rising ever higher. A new stage has begun in the development of the general crisis of capitalism. This is shown by the triumph of socialism in a large group of European and Asian countries embracing one-third of mankind, the powerful growth of the forces fighting for socialism throughout the world, and the steady weakening of the imperialist positions in the economic competition with socialism. The tremendous new upsurge of the national liberation struggle and the mounting disintegration of the colonial system. The growing instability of the entire world economic system of capitalism. The sharpening contradictions of capitalism, resulting from the growth of state monopoly capitalism and militarism. The increasing contradictions between monopolies and the interests of the nation as a whole. The curtailment of bourgeois democracy and the tendency to adopt autocratic and fascist methods of government. And a profound crisis in bourgeois politics and ideology. This stage is distinguished by the fact that it is set in not as a result of the world war, but in the conditions of competition and struggle between the two systems, an increasing change in the balance of forces in favor of socialism, and a marked aggravation of all the contradictions of imperialism. It has taken place at a time when a successful struggle by the peace-loving forces to bring about and promote peaceful coexistence has prevented the imperialists from undermining world peace by their aggressive actions and in an atmosphere of growing struggle by the broad masses of the people for democracy, national liberation, and socialism. All the revolutionary forces are rallying against imperialist oppression and exploitation. The peoples who are building socialism and communism, the revolutionary movement of the working class in the capitalist countries, the national liberation struggle of the oppressed peoples, and the general democratic movement, these great forces of our time are merging into one powerful current, that undermines and destroys the world imperialist system. The central factors of our day are the international working class and its chief creation, the world socialist system. They are an earnest of victory in the struggle for peace, democracy, national liberation, socialism, and human progress. Section 2. A new stage has begun in the development of the world socialist system. The Soviet Union is successfully carrying on the full-scale construction of a communist society. Other countries of the socialist camp are successfully laying the foundations of socialism, and some of them have already entered the period of construction of a developed socialist society. The socialist system as a whole has scored decisive victories. 
These victories signify the triumph of Marxism-Leninism. They show clearly to all the peoples who are under the domination of capital that a society based on this science opens up immense opportunities for the fullest development of economy and culture, for the provision of a high standard of living, and a peaceful and happy life for people. The Soviet people, successfully carrying out the seven-year economic development plan, are rapidly building up a material and technical basis for communism. Soviet science has ushered in what is virtually a new era in the development of world civilization. It has initiated the exploration of outer space, furnishing impressive evidence of the economic and technical might of the socialist camp. The Soviet Union is the first country in history to be blazing a trail to communism for all mankind. It is the most striking example and most powerful bulwark for the peoples of the world in their struggle for peace, democratic freedoms, national independence, and social progress. The People's Revolution in China dealt a crushing blow to the positions of imperialism in Asia and contributed in great measure to the balance of the world forces changing in favor of socialism. By giving a further powerful impetus to the national liberation movement, it exerted tremendous influence on the peoples, especially those of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The People's Democratic Republics of Albania, Bulgaria, Hungary, the German Democratic Republic, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, China, the Korean People's Democratic Republic, Mongolia, Poland, Romania, and the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic, which, together with the Great Soviet Union, formed the mighty socialist camp, have within a historically short period made remarkable progress in socialist construction. People's government in these countries has proved its unshakable solidity. Socialist relations of production predominate in the national economy. The exploitation of man by man has been abolished forever, or is being abolished. The success of the policy of socialist industrialization has led to a great economic upsurge in the socialist countries, which are developing their economy much faster than the capitalist countries. All these countries have established a developed industry. Agrarian in the past, they have become, or are becoming, industrial agrarian countries. In recent years, all the people's democracies have solved, or have been successfully solving, the most difficult problem of socialist construction, that of transferring the peasantry on a voluntary basis from the road of small private farming to the road of large-scale cooperative farming on socialist lines. Lenin's cooperative plan has proved its great vitality both for countries where the peasants' attachment to private land ownership was a long-standing tradition and for countries that have recently put an end to feudal relations. The fraternal alliance of workers and peasants, which is led by the working class, and the maintenance and consolidation of which is, as Lenin taught, a supreme principle of the dictatorship of the proletariat, has grown stronger. In the course of socialist construction, this alliance of two classes of working people, which constitutes the political foundation of the socialist system, develops continuously and further strengthens people's rule under the leadership of the working class, and promotes the socialist reorganization of agriculture in accordance with the Leninist principle of voluntary cooperation of the peasantry. Historic changes have taken place in the social structure of society. The classes of landlords and capitalists no longer exist in the people's democracies. The working class has become the main force of society. Its ranks are growing. Its political consciousness and maturity have increased. Socialism has delivered the peasantry from age-long poverty and has made it an active force in social progress. A new socialist intelligentsia, flesh of the flesh of the working people, is arising. All citizens have free access to knowledge and culture. Socialism has thus created not only political, but material conditions for the cultural development of society, for the all-around and complete development of the gifts and abilities of man. The standard of life of the people is improving steadily thanks to economic progress. An unbreakable alliance of the working people of all nationalities has formed and has been consolidated in multinational socialist states. The triumph of Marxist-Leninist national policy in the socialist countries, genuine equality of nationalities, and their economic and cultural progress serve as an inspiring example for the peoples fighting against national oppression. In the people's democracies, socialist ideology has achieved notable successes in its struggle against bourgeois ideology. It is a long struggle that will go on until the complete emancipation of the minds of the people from the survivals of bourgeois ideology. The moral and political unity of society, which for the first time in history has come into existence and firmly established itself in the Soviet Union, is growing now in the other socialist countries as well. This makes it possible to use the creative energy of free workers most effectively for promoting the growth of the productive forces and the prosperity of socialist society. 
socialist society is improving steadily and becoming more and more mature. Day after day, it gives rise to a communist attitude to labor and other elements of the future communist society. The methods of socialist economic management and economic planning are steadily improving. Socialist democracy continues to develop. The masses are playing an increasing role in directing economic and cultural development. Certain functions of the state are being gradually transferred to public organizations. Today, the restoration of capitalism has been made socially and economically impossible, not only in the Soviet Union, but in the other socialist countries as well. The combined forces of the socialist camp reliably safeguard every socialist country against encroachments by imperialist reaction. Thus, the rallying of the socialist states in one camp, and the growing unity and steadily increasing strength of this camp, ensure complete victory for socialism within the entire system. Thanks to the heroic effort of the working class and the peasantry, and to the tremendous work of the communist and workers' parties, most favorable objective opportunities have been provided in the past years for the further rapid development of the productive forces, for gaining the maximum time and achieving victory for the socialist countries in peaceful economic competition with capitalism. The Marxist-Leninist parties heading the socialist countries consider it their duty to make proper use of these opportunities. Having achieved major victories and withstood serious tests, the Communist parties have gained ample and varied experience in directing socialist construction. The socialist countries and the socialist camp as a whole owe their achievements to the proper application of the general objective laws governing socialist construction, with due regard to the historical peculiarities of each country and to the interests of the entire socialist system. They owe them to the efforts of the peoples of those countries, to their close fraternal cooperation and mutual internationalist assistance, and above all, to the fraternal internationalistic assistance from the Soviet Union. The experience of development of the socialist countries is added evidence that mutual assistance and support and utilization of all the advantages of unity and solidarity among the countries of the socialist camp are a primary international condition for their achievements and successes. Imperialist, Renegade and revisionist hopes of a split within the socialist camp are built upon sand and doomed to failure. All the socialist countries cherish the unity of the socialist camp like the apple of their eye. The world economic system of socialism is united by common socialist relations of production and is developing in accordance with the economic laws of socialism. Its successful development requires consistent application in socialist construction of the law of planned, proportionate development encouragement of the creative initiative of the people, continuous improvement of the system of international division of labor through the coordination of national economic plans, specialization, and cooperation in production within the world socialist system on the basis of voluntary participation, mutual benefit, and vigorous improvement of the scientific and technological standard. It requires study of collective experience, extended cooperation, and fraternal mutual assistance. Gradual elimination along these lines of historical differences in the levels of economic development and the provision of a material basis for a more or less simultaneous transition of all the peoples of the socialist system to communism. Socialist construction in the various countries is a source of collective experience for the socialist camp as a whole. A thorough study of this experience by the fraternal parties and its proper utilization and elaboration with due regard to specific conditions and national peculiarities are an immutable law of the development of every socialist country. In developing industrial and agricultural production in their countries at a high rate, in keeping with the possibilities they have, the communist and workers' parties of the socialist countries consider it their internationalist duty to make full use of all the advantages of the socialist system and the internal resources of every country, to carry out, by joint effort and as speedily as possible, the historic task of surpassing the world capitalist system in overall industrial and agricultural production, and then to outstrip the economically most developed capitalist countries in per capita output and in the standard of living. To carry out this task, it is necessary steadily to improve political and economic work, continuously to improve the methods of economic management, and to run the socialist economy along scientific lines. This calls for a higher productivity of labor to be achieved through continuous technical progress, economic planning, strict observance of the Leninist principle of providing material incentives and moral stimuli to work for the good of society by heightening the political consciousness of the people, and for control over the measure of labor and consumption. To provide a material basis for the transition of the socialist countries to communism, it is indispensable to achieve a high level of production through the use of the latest techniques, 
electrification of the national economy, and mechanization and automation of production, without which it is impossible to provide the abundance of consumer goods required by a communist society. On this basis, it is necessary to develop communist social relations, vigorously promote the political consciousness of the people, and educate the members of the new communist society. The socialist camp is a social, economic, and political community of free and sovereign peoples, united by the close bonds of international socialist solidarity, by common interests and objectives, and following the path of socialism and communism. It is an inviolable law of the mutual relations between socialist countries strictly to adhere to the principles of Marxism-Leninism and socialist internationalism. Every country in the socialist camp is ensured genuinely equal rights and independence, guided by the principles of complete equality, mutual advantage, and comradely mutual assistance, the socialist states improve their all-round economic, political, and cultural cooperation, which meets both the interests of each socialist country and those of the socialist camp as a whole. One of the greatest achievements of the world socialist system is the practical confirmation of the Marxist-Leninist thesis that national antagonisms diminish with the decline of class antagonisms. In contrast to the laws of the capitalist system, which is characterized by antagonistic contradictions between classes, nations, and states leading to armed conflicts, there are no objective causes in the nature of the socialist system for contradictions and conflicts between the peoples and states belonging to it. Its development leads to greater unity among the states and nations, and to the consolidation of all the forms of cooperation between them. Under socialism, the development of national economy, culture, and statehood goes hand in hand with the strengthening and development of the entire world socialist system, and with an ever greater consolidation of the unity of nations. The interests of the socialist system as a whole, and national interests, are harmoniously combined. It is on this basis that the moral and political unity of all the peoples of the great socialist community has arisen and has been growing. Fraternal friendship and mutual assistance of peoples, born of the socialist system, have superseded the political isolation and national egoism typical of capitalism. The common interests of the peoples of the socialist countries and the interests of peace and socialism demand the proper combination of the principles of socialist internationalism and socialist patriotism in politics. Every communist party which has become the ruling party in the state bears historical responsibility for the destinies of both its country and the entire socialist camp. The Declaration of 1957 points out quite correctly that undue emphasis on the role of national peculiarities and departure from the universal truth of Marxism-Leninism regarding the socialist revolution and socialist construction prejudice the common cause of socialism. The Declaration also states quite correctly that Marxism-Leninism demands creative application of the general principles of socialist revolution and socialist construction depending on the specific historical conditions in the country concerned, and it does not permit of a mechanical copying of the policies and tactics of the communist parties of other countries. Disregard of national peculiarities may lead the party of the proletariat to being isolated from reality, from the masses, and may injure the socialist cause. Manifestations of nationalism and national narrow-mindedness do not disappear automatically with the establishment of the socialist system. If fraternal relations and friendship between the socialist countries are to be strengthened, it is necessary that the communist and workers' parties pursue a Marxist-Leninist internationalist policy, that all working people be educated in a spirit of internationalism and patriotism, and that a resolute struggle be waged to eliminate the survivals of bourgeois nationalism and chauvinism. The communist and workers' parties tirelessly educate the working people in the spirit of socialist internationalism and intolerance of all manifestations of nationalism and chauvinism. Solid unity of the communist and workers' parties and of the peoples of the socialist countries and their loyalty to Marxism-Leninism are the main source of the strength and invincibility of each socialist country and the socialist camp as a whole. In blazing a trail to communism, the peoples of the socialist countries are creating a prototype of a new society for all mankind. The working people of the capitalist world are following the constructive effort of the builders of socialism and communism with keen interest. This makes the Marxist-Leninist parties and the peoples of the socialist countries accountable to the international working class movement for the successful building of socialism and communism. The communist and workers' parties see it as their task indefatigably to strengthen the great socialist community of nations, whose international role in and influence upon the course of world events are growing from year to year. The time has come when the socialist states have, by forming a world system, become an international force, exerting a powerful influence on world development. 
There are now real opportunities of solving cardinal problems of modern times in a new way, in the interest of peace, democracy, and socialism. Section 3. And there's a footnote here. It says, in the document transcribed, there's no indication as to where Section 2 ends and Section 2 begins. Responsibility for this omission appears to lie with the editors of Political Affairs magazine, as it also appears in another printing drawn from that source. In pages 76 to 97 of Communist and Workers' Party's Manifesto, adopted November-December 1960, Interpretation and Analysis, hearings before the subcommittee to investigate the administration of the Internal Security Act and other internal security laws of the Committee on the Judiciary, U.S. Senate, 87th Congress, First Session, Testimony of J. Lovestone, January 6, February 2, 1961, Washington, U.S. Government Printing Office, 1961. A transcription published in Peking Review, Volume 3, Number 49 and 50, December 13, 1960, places the start of Section 3 here. Back to the text. The problem of war and peace is the most burning problem of our time. War is a constant companion of capitalism. The system of exploitation of man by man and the system of extermination of man by man are two aspects of the capitalist system. Imperialism has already inflicted two devastating world wars on mankind and now threatens to plunge it into an even more terrible catastrophe. Monstrous means of mass annihilation and destruction have been developed which, if used in a new war, can cause unheard of destruction to entire countries and reduce key centers of world industry and culture to ruins. Such a war would bring death and suffering to hundreds of millions of people, among them people in countries not involved in it. Imperialism spells grave danger to the whole of mankind. The peoples must now be more vigilant than ever. As long as imperialism exists, there will be soil for wars of aggression. The peoples of all countries know that the danger of a new world war still persists. U.S. imperialism is the main force of aggression and war. Its policy embodies the ideology of militant reaction. The U.S. imperialists, together with the imperialists of Britain, France, and West Germany, have drawn many countries into NATO, CENTO, CETO, and other military blocs under the guise of combating the, quote, communist menace. It has enmeshed the so-called free world, that is, capitalist countries which depend on them, in a network of military bases spearheaded first and foremost against the socialist countries. The existence of these blocks and bases endanger universal peace and security and not only encroaches upon the sovereignty, but also imperils the very life of those countries which put their territory at the disposal of the U.S. militarists. The imperialist forces of the USA, Britain, and France have made a criminal deal with West German imperialism. In West Germany, militarism has been revived, and the restoration is being pushed ahead of a vast regular army under the command of Hitler generals, which the U.S. imperialists are equipping with nuclear and rocket weapons and other modern means of mass annihilation, a fact which draws emphatic protests from the peace-loving peoples. Military bases are being provided for this aggressive army in France and other West European countries. The threat to peace and the security of the European nations from West German imperialism is increasing. The West German revenge seekers openly declare their intention to revise the borders established after the Second World War. Like the Hitler clique in its day, the West German militarists are preparing war against the socialist and other countries of Europe and strive to effect their own aggressive plans. West Berlin has been transformed into a seat of international provocation. The Bonn state has become the chief enemy of peaceful coexistence, disarmament, and relaxation of tension in Europe. The aggressive plans of the West German imperialists must be opposed by the united might of all the peace-loving countries and nations of Europe. An especially big part in the struggle against the aggressive designs of the West German militarists is played by the German Democratic Republic. The meeting regards it as the duty of all the countries in the socialist camp and of all the peace-loving peoples to defend the German Democratic Republic, the outpost of socialism in Western Europe, and the true expression of the peace aspirations of the German nation. The U.S. imperialists are also busy reviving the hotbed of war in the Far East, trampling upon the national independence of the Japanese people, and contrary to their will, they have, in collusion with the Japanese reactionary ruling circles, imposed upon Japan a new military treaty which pursues aggressive aims against the Soviet Union, the Chinese People's Republic, and other peace-loving countries. The U.S. invaders have occupied the island of Taiwan, which belongs to the Chinese People's Republic, and South Korea and are interfering more and more in the affairs of South Vietnam. 
They have turned them into hotbeds of dangerous military provocations and gambles, threatening Cuba with aggression and interfering in the affairs of the peoples of Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. The U.S. imperialists strive to create new seats of war in different parts of the world. They use such forms of regional alliance as, for example, the Organization of American States to retain their economic and political control and to involve the peoples of Latin America in the realization of their aggressive schemes. The U.S. imperialists have set up a huge war machinery and refuse to allow its reduction. The imperialists frustrate all constructive disarmament proposals by the Soviet Union and other peaceful countries. The arms race is going on. Stockpiles of nuclear weapons are becoming dangerously large. Defying protests from their own people and the peoples of other countries, particularly in the African continent, the French ruling circles are testing and manufacturing atomic weapons. The U.S. militarists are preparing to resume disastrous atomic tests. Military provocations that threaten serious international conflicts continue. The U.S. ruling circles have wrecked the Paris meeting of the heads of government of the four great powers by their policy of provocations and aggressive acts and they have set out to increase international tension and aggravate the Cold War. The war menace has grown. The imperialist provocations against peace have aroused the indignation and resistance of the peoples. U.S. imperialism has exposed itself still more, and its influence in the world has sustained fresh and telling blows. The aggressive nature of imperialism has not changed, but real forces have appeared that are capable of foiling its plans of aggression. War is not fatally inevitable. Had the imperialists been able to do what they wanted, they already would have plunged mankind into the abyss of the calamities and horrors of a new world war. But the time is past when the imperialists could decide at will whether there should or should not be war. More than once in the past years, the imperialists have brought mankind to the brink of world catastrophe by starting local wars. The resolute stand of the Soviet Union, of the other socialist states, and of all the peaceful forces put an end to the Anglo-Franco-Israeli intervention in Egypt and averted a military invasion of Syria, Iraq, and some other countries by the imperialists. The heroic people of Algeria continue their valiant battle for independence and freedom. The peoples of the Congo and Laos are resisting the criminal acts of the imperialists with increasing firmness. Experience shows that it's possible to combat effectively the local wars started by the imperialists, and to stamp out successfully the hotbeds of such wars. The time has come when the attempts of the imperialist aggressors to start a world war can be curbed. World war can be prevented by the joint efforts of the world socialist camp, the international working class, the national liberation movement, all the countries opposing war, and all peace-loving forces. The development of international relations in our day is determined by the struggle of the two social systems, the struggle of the forces of socialism, peace and democracy, against the forces of imperialism, reaction, and aggression, a struggle in which the superiority of the forces of socialism, peace, and democracy is becoming increasingly obvious. For the first time in history, war is opposed by great and organized forces, the mighty Soviet Union, which now leads the world in the decisive branches of science and technology, the entire socialist camp, which has placed its great material and political might at the service of peace, a growing number of peace-loving countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, which have a vital interest in preserving peace, the international working class and its organizations, above all, the communist parties, the national liberation movement of the peoples of the colonies and dependent countries, the world peace movement, and the neutral countries which want no share in the imperialist policy of war and advocate peaceful coexistence. The policy of peaceful coexistence is also favored by a definite section of the bourgeoisie of the developed capitalist countries, which takes a sober view of the relationship of forces and of the dire consequences of a modern war. The broadest possible united front of peace supporters, fighters against the imperialist policy of aggression and war inspired by U.S. imperialism, is essential to preserve world peace. Concerted and vigorous actions of all the forces of peace can safeguard the peace and prevent a new war. The democratic and peace forces today have no task more pressing than that of safeguarding humanity against a global thermonuclear disaster. The unprecedented destructive power of modern means of warfare demands that the main actions of the anti-war and peace-loving forces be directed toward preventing war. The struggle against war cannot be put off until war breaks out, for then it may prove too late for many areas of the globe and for their population to combat it. The struggle against the threat of a new war must be waged now and not when atom and hydrogen bombs begin to fall, and it must gain in strength from day to day. 
The important thing is to curb the aggressors in good time, to prevent war, and not to let it break out. The fight for peace today means to maintain the greatest vigilance, indefatigably to lay bare the policy of the imperialists, and to keep a watchful eye on the intrigues and maneuvers of the warmongers, arouse the righteous indignation of the peoples against those who are heading for war, organize the peace forces still better, continuously intensify mass actions for peace, and promote cooperation with all countries which have no interest in new wars. In the countries where the imperialists have established war bases, it's necessary to step up the struggle for their abolition, which is an important factor for fortifying national independence, defending sovereignty, and preventing war. The struggle of the peoples against the militarization of their countries should be combined with the struggle against the capitalist monopolies connected with the U.S. imperialists. Today, as never before, it is important to fight perseveringly in all countries to make the peace movement thrive and extend to towns and villages, factories and offices. The peace movement is the broadest movement of our time, involving people of diverse political and religious creeds, of diverse classes of society, who are all united by the noble urge to prevent new wars and to secure enduring peace. Further consolidation of the world socialist system will be of prime importance in preserving durable peace. So long as there is no disarmament, the socialist countries must maintain their defense potential at an adequate level. In the opinion of communists, the tasks which must be accomplished first of all if peace is to be safeguarded are to stop the arms race, ban nuclear weapons, their tests and production, dismantle foreign war bases and withdraw foreign troops from other countries, disband military blocs, conclude a peace treaty with Germany, turn West Berlin into a demilitarized free city, thwart the designs of the West German revanchists, and prevent the revival of Japanese militarism. History has placed a great responsibility for warding off a new world war, first and foremost, on the international working class. The imperialists plot and join forces to start a thermonuclear war. The international working class must close its ranks to save mankind from the disaster of a new world war. No political, religious, or other differences should be an obstacle to all the forces of the working class uniting against the war danger. The hour has struck to counter the forces of war by the mighty will and joint action of all the contingents and organizations of the world proletariat, to unite its forces to avert world war and safeguard peace. The Communist parties regard the fight for peace as their prime task. They call on the working class, trade unions, cooperatives, women's and youth leagues and organizations, on all working people, irrespective of their political and religious convictions, firmly to repulse by mass struggles all acts of aggression on the part of the imperialists. But should the imperialist maniacs start war, the peoples will sweep capitalism out of existence and bury it. The foreign policy of the socialist countries rests on the firm foundation of the Leninist principle of peaceful coexistence and economic competition between the socialist and capitalist countries. In conditions of peace, The socialist system increasingly reveals its advantages over the capitalist system in all fields of economy, culture, science, and technology. The near future will bring the forces of peace and socialism new successes. The USSR will become the leading industrial power of the world. China will become a mighty industrial state. The socialist system will be turning out more than half the world industrial product. The peace zone will expand. The working class movement in the capitalist countries and the national liberation movement in the colonies and dependencies will achieve new victories. The disintegration of the colonial system will become completed. The superiority of the forces of socialism and peace will be absolute. In these conditions, a real possibility will have arisen to exclude world war from the life of society, even before socialism achieves complete victory on earth, with capitalism still existing in a part of the world. The victory of socialism all over the world will completely remove the social and national causes of all wars. The communists of all the world uphold peaceful coexistence unanimously and consistently and battle resolutely for the prevention of war. The communists must work untiringly among the masses to prevent underestimation of the possibility of averting a world war, underestimation of the possibility of peaceful coexistence, and at the same time, underestimation of the danger of war.
In a world divided into two systems, the only correct and reasonable principle of international relations is the principle of peaceful coexistence of states with different social systems, as advanced by Lenin and further elaborated in the Moscow Declaration and the Peace Manifesto of 1957, in the decisions of the 10th and 21st Congresses of the CPSU, and in the documents of other Communist and Workers' Parties. The five principles jointly advanced by the Chinese People's Republic and the Republic of India, and the propositions adopted at the Bandung Conference, accord with the interests of peace and the peace-loving peoples. Peaceful coexistence of countries with different systems or destructive war, this is the alternative today. There is no other choice. Communists emphatically reject the U.S. doctrine of Cold War and brinksmanship, for it is a policy leading to thermonuclear catastrophe. By upholding the principle of peaceful coexistence, communists fight for the complete cessation of the Cold War, disbandment of military blocs, and dismantling of military bases, for general and complete disarmament under international control, the settlement of international disputes through negotiation, respect for the equality of states and their territorial integrity, independence, and sovereignty, non-interference in each other's internal affairs, extensive development of trade, cultural, and scientific ties between nations. The policy of peaceful coexistence meets the basic interests of all peoples, of all who want no new cruel wars and seek durable peace. This policy strengthens the positions of socialism, enhances the prestige and international influence of the socialist countries, and promotes the prestige and influence of the communist parties in the capitalist countries. Peace is a loyal ally of socialism, for time is working for socialism against capitalism. The policy of peaceful coexistence is a policy of mobilizing the masses and launching vigorous action against the enemies of peace. Peaceful coexistence of states does not imply renunciation of the class struggle, as the revisionists claim. The coexistence of states with different social systems is a form of class struggle between socialism and capitalism. In conditions of peaceful coexistence, favorable opportunities are provided for the development of the class struggle in the capitalist countries and the national liberation movement of the peoples of the colonial and dependent countries. In their turn, the successes of the revolutionary class and national liberation struggle promote peaceful coexistence. The communists consider it their duty to fortify the faith of the people in the possibility of furthering peaceful coexistence, their determination to prevent world war. They will do their utmost for the people to weaken imperialism and limit its sphere of action by an active struggle for peace, democracy, and national liberation. Peaceful coexistence of countries with different social systems does not mean conciliation of the socialist and bourgeois ideologies. On the contrary, it implies intensification of the struggle of the working class, of all the communist parties, for the triumph of socialist ideas. But ideological and political disputes between states must not be settled through war. The meeting considers that the implementation of the program for general and complete disarmament put forward by the Soviet Union would be of historic importance for the destinies of mankind. To realize this program means to eliminate the very possibility of waging wars between countries. It is not easy to realize owing to the stubborn resistance of the imperialists. Hence, it is essential to wage an active and determined struggle against the aggressive imperialist forces with the aim of carrying this program into practice. It is necessary to wage the struggle on an increasing scale and to strive perseveringly to achieve tangible results. The banning of the testing and manufacture of nuclear weapons, the abolition of military blocks and war bases on foreign soil, and a substantial reduction of armed forces and armaments, all of which should pave the way to general disarmament. Through an active, determined struggle by the socialist and other peace-loving countries, by the international working class, and the broad masses in all countries, it is possible to isolate the aggressive circles, foil the arms race and war preparations, and force the imperialists into an agreement on general disarmament. The arms race is not a war deterrent, nor does it make for a high degree of employment and well-being of the population. It leads to war. Only a handful of monopolies and war speculators are interested in the arms race. In the capitalist countries, the people constantly demand that military expenditures be reduced, and the funds thus released be used to improve the living conditions of the masses. In each country, it's necessary to promote a broad mass movement for the use of the funds and resources to be released through disarmament for the needs of civilian production, housing, health, public education, social security, scientific research, etc. Disarmament has now become a fighting slogan of the masses, a pressing historical necessity. By an active and resolute struggle, the imperialists must be made to meet this demand of the peoples. 
The communist and workers' parties of the socialist countries will go on consistently pursuing the policy of peaceful coexistence of states with different social systems and doing their utmost to spare the peoples the horrors and calamities of a new war. They will display the greatest vigilance toward imperialism, vigorously strengthen the might and defensive capacity of the entire socialist camp, and take every step to safeguard the security of the peoples and preserve peace. The communists regard it as their historical mission not only to abolish exploitation and poverty on a world scale, and to rule out for all time the possibility of any kind of war in the life of human society, but also to deliver mankind from the nightmare of a new world war already in our time. The communist parties will devote all their strength and energy to this great historical mission. Section 4. National liberation revolutions have triumphed in vast areas of the world. About 40 new sovereign states have arisen in Asia and Africa in the 15 post-war years. The victory of the Cuban Revolution has powerfully stimulated the struggle of the Latin American peoples for complete national independence. A new historical period has set in in the life of mankind. The peoples of Asia, Africa, and Latin America that have won their freedom have begun to take an active part in world politics. The complete collapse of colonialism is imminent. The breakdown of the system of colonial slavery under the impact of the National Liberation Movement is a development ranking second in historic importance only to the formation of the world socialist system. The Great October Socialist Revolution aroused the East and drew the colonial peoples into the common current of the worldwide revolutionary movement. This development was greatly facilitated by the Soviet Union's victory in the Second World War the establishment of people's democracy in a number of European and Asian countries, the triumph of the socialist revolution in Russia, and the formation of the world socialist system. The forces of world socialism contributed decisively to the struggle of the colonial and dependent peoples for liberation from imperialist oppression. The socialist system has become a reliable shield for the development of the peoples who have won freedom. The national liberation movement receives powerful support from the international working class movement. The face of Asia has changed radically. The colonial order is collapsing in Africa. A front of active struggle against imperialism has opened in Latin America. Hundreds of millions of people in Asia, Africa, and other parts of the world have won their independence in hard-fought battles with imperialism. Communists have always recognized the progressive, revolutionary significance of national liberation wars. They are the most active champions of national independence. The existence of the world socialist system and the weakening of the positions of imperialism have provided the oppressed peoples with new opportunities of winning independence. The peoples of the colonial countries win their independence both through armed struggle and by non-military methods, depending on the specific conditions in the country concerned. They secure durable victory through a powerful national liberation movement. The colonial powers never bestow freedom on the colonial peoples and never leave of their own free will the countries they are exploiting. The United States is the mainstay of colonialism today. The imperialists, headed by the USA, make desperate efforts to preserve colonial exploitation of the peoples of the former colonies by new methods and in new forms. The monopolies try to retain their hold on the levers of economic control and political influence in Asian, African, and Latin American countries. These efforts are aimed at preserving their positions in the economy of the countries which have gained freedom, and at capturing new positions under the guise of economic aid, drawing them into military blocks, implanting military dictatorships, and setting up war bases there. The imperialists endeavor to emasculate and undermine the national sovereignty of the newly free countries, to misrepresent the principle of self-determination of nations, to impose new forms of colonial domination under the spurious slogan of interdependence, to put their puppets in power in these countries, and to bribe a section of the bourgeoisie. They resort to the poisoned weapon of national strife to undermine the young states that are not yet strong enough. They make ample use of aggressive military blocks and bilateral military alliances to achieve these ends. The imperialists' accomplices are the most reactionary sections of the local exploiting classes. The urgent tasks of national rebirth facing the countries that have shaken off the colonial yoke cannot be effectively accomplished unless a determined struggle is waged against imperialism and the remnants of feudalism by all the patriotic forces of the nations united in a single national democratic front. The national democratic tasks on the basis of which the progressive forces of the nation can and do unite in the countries which have won their freedom are the consolidation of political independence, the carrying out of agrarian reforms in the interest of the peasantry, 
the elimination of the survivals of feudalism, the uprooting of imperialist economic domination, the restriction of foreign monopolies and their expulsion from the national economy, the creation and development of a national industry, improvement of the living standard, the democratization of social life, the pursuance of an independent and peaceful foreign policy, and the development of economic and cultural cooperation with the socialist and other friendly countries. The working class, which has played an outstanding role in the fight for national liberation, demands the complete and consistent accomplishment of the tasks of the national anti-imperialist democratic revolution and resists reactionary attempts to check social progress. The solution of the peasant problem, which directly affects the interests of the vast majority of the population, is of the utmost importance to these countries. Without radical agrarian reforms, it is impossible to solve the food problem and sweep away the remnants of medievalism which fetter the development of the productive forces in agriculture and industry. The creation and extension on a democratic basis of the state sector in the national economy, particularly in industry, a sector independent from foreign monopolies and gradually becoming a determining factor in the country's economy, is of great importance in these countries. The alliance of the working class and the peasantry is the most important force in winning and defending national independence, accomplishing far-reaching democratic transformations and ensuring social progress. This alliance is called upon to be the basis of a broad national front. The extent to which the national bourgeoisie participates in the liberation struggle also depends to no small degree upon its strength and stability. A big role can be played by the national patriotic forces, by all elements of the nation prepared to fight for national independence against imperialism. In present conditions, the national bourgeoisie of the colonial and dependent countries, unconnected with imperialist circles, is objectively interested in the principal tasks of anti-imperialist, anti-feudal revolution, and therefore retains the capacity of participating in the revolutionary struggle against imperialism and feudalism. In that sense, it is progressive. But it is unstable. Though progressive, it's inclined to compromise with imperialism and feudalism. Owing to its dual nature, the extent to which the national bourgeoisie participates in revolution differs from country to country. This depends on concrete conditions, on changes in the relationship of class forces, on the sharpness of the contradictions between imperialism, feudalism, and the people, and on the depth of the contradictions between imperialism, feudalism, and the national bourgeoisie. After winning political independence, the peoples seek solutions to the social problems raised in life and to the problems of reinforcing national independence. Different classes and parties offer different solutions. Which course of development to choose is the internal affair of the peoples themselves. As social contradictions grow, the national bourgeoisie inclines more and more to compromising with domestic reaction and imperialism. The people, however, begin to see that the best way to abolish age-long backwardness and improve their living standard is that of non-capitalist development. Only thus can the peoples free themselves from exploitation, poverty, and hunger. The working class and the broad peasant masses are to play the leading part in solving this basic social problem. In the present historical situation, favorable domestic and international conditions arise in many countries for the establishment of an independent national democracy that is, a state which consistently upholds its political and economic independence, fights against imperialism and its military blocs, against military bases on its territory, a state which fights against the new forms of colonialism and the penetration of imperialist capital, a state which rejects dictatorial and despotic methods of government, a state in which the people are ensured broad democratic rights and freedoms, such as freedom of speech, press, assembly, demonstrations, establishment of political parties and social organizations, the opportunity to work for the enactment of an agrarian reform and other democratic and social changes, and for participation in shaping government policy. The formation and consolidation of national democracies enables the countries concerned to make rapid social progress and play an active part in the people's struggle for peace against the aggressive policies of the imperialist camp for the complete abolition of the colonial yoke. The Communist parties are working actively for a consistent completion of the anti-imperialist, anti-feudal democratic revolution, for the establishment of national democracies, for a radical improvement in the living standard of the people. They support those actions of national governments leading to the consolidation of the gains achieved and undermining the imperialists' positions. At the same time, they firmly oppose anti-democratic, anti-popular acts and those measures of the ruling circles which endanger national independence 
Communists expose attempts by the reactionary section of the bourgeoisie to represent its selfish, narrow class interests as those of the entire nation. They expose the demagogic use by bourgeois politicians of socialist slogans for the same purpose. They work for a genuine democratization of social life and rally all the progressive forces to combat despotic regimes or to curb tendencies towards setting up such regimes. The aims of the communists accord with the supreme interests of the nation. The reactionary's effort to break up the National Front under the slogan of anti-communism and to isolate the communists, the foremost contingent of the liberation movement, is contrary to the national interests of the people and is fraught with the loss of national gains. The socialist countries are true and sincere friends of the peoples fighting for liberation and of those who have thrown off the imperialist yoke, while rejecting on principle any interference in the internal affairs of young national states, they consider it their internationalist duty to help the peoples in strengthening their independence. They help and support these countries generously in achieving progress, creating a national industry, developing and consolidating the national economy, and training national personnel, and cooperate with them in the struggle for world peace against imperialist aggression. The class-conscious workers of the colonial powers, who realized that, quote, no nation can be free if it oppresses other nations, unquote, fought consistently for the self-determination of the nations oppressed by the imperialists. Now that these nations are taking the path of national independence, it is the internationalist duty of the workers, and all democratic forces in the industrially developed capitalist countries, to assist them vigorously in their struggle against the imperialists, for national independence, for its consolidation, and to assist them in effectively solving the problems of their economic and cultural rebirth. In so doing, they defend the interests of the popular masses in their own countries. The entire course of the world history of recent decades prompts the complete and final abolition of the colonial system in all its forms and manifestations. All the peoples still languishing in colonial bondage must be given every support in winning their national independence. All forms of colonial oppression must be abolished. The abolition of colonialism will also be of great importance in easing international tension and consolidating universal peace. This meeting expresses solidarity with all the peoples of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania who are carrying on a heroic struggle against imperialism. The meeting hails the peoples of the young states of Africa who have achieved political independence, an important step toward complete emancipation. The meeting extends heartfelt regards and support to the heroic Algerian people fighting for freedom and national independence, and demands an immediate cessation of the aggressive war against Algeria. It wrathfully condemns the inhuman system of racial persecution and tyranny in the Union of South Africa, apartheid, and urges Democrats throughout the world to actively support the peoples of South Africa in their struggle for freedom and equality. The meeting demands non-interference in the sovereign rights of the peoples of Cuba, the Congo, and all the other countries that have won their freedom. All the socialist countries and the international working class and communist movement see it as their duty to render the fullest moral and material assistance to the peoples fighting to free themselves from imperialist and colonial tyranny. Section 5. The new balance of world forces offers the communist and workers' parties new opportunities of carrying out the historic tasks they face in the struggle for peace, national independence, democracy, and socialism. The communist parties determine the prospects and tasks of revolution in keeping with the concrete historical and social conditions obtaining in their respective countries and with due regard for the international situation. They're waging a selfless struggle, doing everything already in present conditions, without waiting until socialism triumphs, to defend the interests of the working class and the people, improve their living conditions, and extend the democratic rights and freedoms of the people. Knowing that the brunt of the struggle for the liberation of its people from capitalist oppression rests upon it, the working class and its revolutionary vanguard will, with increasing energy, press forward its offensive against the domination of oppressors and exploiters in every field of political, economic, and ideological activity in each country. In the process of the struggle, the masses are prepared and conditions arise for decisive battles for the overthrow of capitalism, for the victory of socialist revolution. The main blow in present conditions is directed with growing force at the capitalist monopolies, which are chiefly responsible for the arms race which constitute the bulwark of reaction and aggression at the whole system of state monopoly capitalism, which defends their interests. 
In some non-European developed capitalist countries which are under the political, economic, and military domination of U.S. imperialism, the working class and the people direct the main blow against U.S. imperialist domination, and also against monopoly capital and other domestic reactionary forces that betray the interests of the nation. In the course of this struggle, all the democratic, patriotic forces of the nation come together in a united front, fighting for the victory of a revolution aimed at achieving genuine national independence and democracy, which create conditions for passing on to the tasks of socialist revolution. The big monopolies encroach on the interests of the working class and the people in general all along the line. The exploitation of working people is gaining in intensity. So is the process in which the broad peasant masses are being ruined. At the same time, the difficulties experienced by the small and middle urban bourgeoisie are growing more acute. The oppression of the big monopolies is becoming increasingly heavier for all sections of the nation. As a result, the contradiction between the handful of monopoly capitalists and all sections of the people is now growing more pronounced, along with the sharpening of the basic class contradiction of bourgeois society, that between labor and capital. The monopolies seek to abolish, or cut down to a bare minimum, the democratic rights of the masses. The reign of open fascist terror continues in some countries. In a number of countries, fascination is expanding in new forms. Dictatorial methods of government are combined with fictitious parliamentary practices that have been stripped of democratic content and reduced to pure form. Many democratic organizations are outlawed and compelled to go underground. Thousands of fighters for the working class cause and champions of peace are in prison. On behalf of all the communists of the world, this meeting expresses proletarian solidarity with the courageous sons and daughters of the working class and the fighters for democracy, languishing behind prison bars in the USA, Spain, Portugal, Japan, West Germany, Greece, Iran, Pakistan, the United Arab Republic, Jordan, Iraq, Argentina, Paraguay, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, the Union of South Africa, the Sudan, and other countries. The meeting urges launching a powerful, worldwide campaign to secure the release of these champions of peace, national independence, and democracy. The working class, peasantry, intellectuals, and the petty and middle urban bourgeoisie are vitally interested in the abolition of monopoly domination. Hence, there are favorable conditions for rallying these forces. Communists hold that this unity is quite feasible on the basis of the struggle for peace, national independence, the protection and extension of democracy, nationalization of the key branches of economy, and democratization of their management, the use of the entire economy for peaceful purposes in order to satisfy the needs of the population, implementation of radical agrarian reforms, improvement of the living conditions of the working people, protection of the interests of the peasantry and the petty and middle urban bourgeoisie against the tyranny of the monopolies. These measures would be an important step along the path of social progress, would meet the interests of the majority of the nation. All these measures are democratic by nature. They do not eliminate the exploitation of man by man, but, if realized, they would limit the power of the monopolies, enhance the prestige and political weight of the working class in the country's affairs, help to isolate the most reactionary forces, and facilitate the unification of all the progressive forces. As they participate in the fight for dramatic reforms, large sections of the population come to realize the necessity of unity of action with the working class and become more active politically. It is the prime duty of the working class and its communist vanguard to head the economic and political struggle of the masses for democratic reforms, for the overthrow of the power of the monopolies, and to assure its success. Communists advocate general democratization of the economic and social scene and of all the administrative, political, and cultural organizations and institutions. Communists regard the struggle for democracy as a component of the struggle for socialism. In this struggle, they continuously strengthen their bonds with the masses, increase their political consciousness, and help them understand the tasks of the socialist revolution and realize the necessity of accomplishing it. This sets the Marxist-Leninist parties completely apart from the reformists, who consider reforms within the framework of the capitalist system as the ultimate goal and deny the necessity of socialist revolution. Marxist-Leninists are firmly convinced that the peoples in the capitalist countries will, in the course of their daily struggle, ultimately come to understand that socialism alone is a real way out for them. Comment, I did. Now that more sections of the population are joining in an active class struggle, it is of the utmost importance that communists should extend their work in trade unions and cooperatives among the peasantry, the youth, 
the women in sports organizations, and the unorganized sections of the population. There are new opportunities now to draw the younger generation into the struggle for peace and democracy and for the great ideals of communism. Lenin's great behest to go deeper into the masses, to work wherever there are masses, to strengthen the ties with the masses in order to lead them, must become a major task for every communist party. The restoration of unity in the trade union movement in countries where it is split, as well as on the international scale, is essential for heightening the role of the working class in political life and for the successful defense of its interests. The working people may belong to different trade unions, but they have common interests. Whenever different trade union associations fought in common in the greatest class battles of recent years, they usually succeeded, precisely because of their unity in having the demands of the working people met. The communist parties believe that there are real prerequisites for re-establishing trade union unity and will work perseveringly to bring it about. In those countries where no trade union democracy exists in practice, the struggle for trade union unity calls for continuous efforts aimed at achieving trade union independence and recognition and observance of the trade union rights of all working people without political and any other discrimination. It is also essential to peace and social progress that the national and international unity of all the other mass democratic movements be restored. Unity among the mass organizations may be achieved through joint action in the struggle for peace, national independence, the preservation and extension of democratic rights, the improvement of living conditions, and the extension of the working people's social rights. The decisive role in the struggle of the popular masses of capitalist countries for the accomplishment of their tasks is played by the alliance of the working class and the working peasantry, which represents the main motive force of social revolution. The split in the ranks of the working class, which the ruling classes, the right-wing social democratic leadership, and reactionary trade union leaders are interested to maintain on a national and international scale, remains the principal obstacle to the accomplishment of the goals of the working class communists work resolutely to eliminate the spirit. The imperialists and reactionaries in various countries resort, along with means of suppression, to means of deception and bribery in order to split and disrupt the solidarity of the working class. The events of the last few years have again confirmed that this split undermines the positions of the working class and is advantageous only to imperialist reaction. Some right-wing social democratic leaders have openly adopted imperialist views, defend the capitalist system, and split the working class. Owing to their hostility to communism and their fear of the mounting influence of socialism in world affairs, they're capitulating to the reactionary, conservative forces. In some countries, the right-wing leadership has succeeded in making the social democratic parties adopt programs in which they openly disowned Marxism, the class struggle, and the traditional socialist slogans. Thereby, they have again done a service to the bourgeoisie. Resistance to this policy of the right-wing leaders is mounting in the social democratic parties. The opposition also embraces a section of the social democratic party functionaries. The forces favoring joint action by the working class and other working people in the struggle for peace, democracy, and social progress are growing. The overwhelming majority in the social democratic parties, particularly the workers, are friends of peace and social progress. Communists will continue to criticize the ideological positions and right-wing opportunist practices of the Social Democrats. They will continue activities aimed at inducing the Social Democratic masses to adopt positions of consistent class struggle against capitalism for the triumph of socialism. The communists are firmly convinced that the ideological differences obtaining between themselves and the Social Democrats must not hinder exchanges of opinion on the pressing problems of the working class movement and the joint struggle, especially against the war danger. Communists regard Social Democrats among the working people as their class brothers. They often work together in trade unions and other organizations and fight jointly for the interests of the working class and the people as a whole. The vital interests of the working class movement demand that the communist and social democratic parties take joint action on a national and international scale to bring about the immediate prohibition of the manufacture, testing, and use of nuclear weapons, the establishment of atom-free zones, general and complete disarmament under international control, the abolition of military bases on foreign soil, and the withdrawal of foreign troops to assist the national liberation movement of the peoples of colonial and dependent countries to safeguard national sovereignty, promote democracy, and resist the fascist menace, improve the living standards of the working people, secure a shorter working week without wage cuts, etc. 
millions of social democrats and some social democratic parties have already, in some form or another, come out in favor of solving these problems. It is safe to say that on overcoming the split in its ranks, on achieving unity of action of all its contingents, the working class of many capitalist countries could deliver a staggering blow to the policy of the ruling circles in the capitalist countries and make them stop preparing a new war, repel the offensive of monopoly capital, and have its daily vital and democratic demands met. Both in the struggle for the improvement of the living conditions of working people, the extension and preservation of their democratic rights, the achievement and defense of national independence, for peace among nations, and also in the struggle to win power and build socialism, the communist parties advocate cooperation with the socialist parties. The communists have the great doctrine of Marxism-Leninism, a doctrine that is consistent, scientifically sustained and borne out by life, and rich international experience in socialist construction. They are prepared to hold discussions with social democrats, for they are certain that this is the best way to compare views, ideas, and experience with the aim of removing deep-rooted prejudices and the split among the working people and of establishing cooperation. The imperialist reactionaries, who seek to arouse distrust for the communist movement and its ideology, continue to intimidate the masses by alleging that the communists need wars between states to overthrow the capitalist system and establish a socialist system. The communist parties emphatically reject this slander. The fact that both world wars, which were started by the imperialists, ended in socialist revolutions by no means implies that the way to social revolution goes necessarily through world war, especially now that there exists a powerful world system of socialism. Marxist-Leninists have never considered that the way to social revolution lies through wars between states. The choice of social system is the inalienable right of the people of each country. Socialist revolution is not an item of import and cannot be imposed from without. It is a result of the internal development of the country concerned of the utmost sharpening of social contradictions in it. The communist parties, which guide themselves by Marxist-Leninist doctrine, have always been against the export of revolution. At the same time, they fight resolutely against imperialist export of counter-revolution. They consider it their internationalist duty to call on the peoples of all countries to unite, to rally all their internal forces, to act vigorously, and, relying on the might of the world socialist system, to prevent or firmly resist imperialist interference in the affairs of any people who have risen in revolution. The Marxist-Leninist parties head the struggle of the working class, the masses of working people, for the accomplishment of the socialist revolution and the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat in one form or another. The forms and course of development of the socialist revolution will depend on the specific balance of the class forces in the country concerned, on the organization and maturity of the working class and its vanguard, and on the extent of the resistance put up by the ruling classes. Whatever form of dictatorship of the proletariat is established, it will always signify an extension of democracy, a transition from formal, bourgeois democracy to genuine democracy, to democracy for working people. The communist parties reaffirm the propositions put forward by the Declaration of 1957 with regard to the forms of transition of different countries from capitalism to socialism. The Declaration points out that the working class and its vanguard, the Marxist-Leninist Party, seek to achieve the socialist revolution by peaceful means. This would accord with the interests of the working class and the people as a whole, with the national interests of the country. Today, in a number of capitalist countries, the working class, headed by its vanguard, has the opportunity, given a united working class and popular front or other workable forms of agreement and political cooperation between the different parties and public organizations, to unite a majority of the people, win state power without civil war, and ensure the transfer of the basic means of production to the hands of the people. Relying on the majority of the people and absolutely rebuffing the opportunist elements incapable of relinquishing the policy of compromise with the capitalists and landlords, the working class can defeat the reactionary, anti-popular forces, secure a firm majority in parliament, transform parliament from an instrument serving the class interests of the bourgeoisie into an instrument serving the working people. So comment, they're not done with the list, but we also pointed this out in the 1957 document, the last one we put up. This was a major source of contention for Hoja and others that said this is basic Bernsteinian revisionism going all the way back to the early days of Lenin. This is a basic no-no, and if you'd like a longer explanation, see Rosa Luxemburg's Reform or Revolution, which we have on the channel. Now, the Khrushchevites, for their part, defended this by saying, well, we're in a different position now because there's this large 
socialist camp. Imperialism is somewhat cowed by it, and it may be possible now to do what was impossible previously. And as I commented in that file, I think at best, sort of the good faith, best case scenario interpretation of what they were saying here is basically it was an overestimation of the strength of the socialist camp at that time. That would be the way to take this in the way that they really meant well and weren't trying to be knowingly revisionist, but really thought that the conditions in the world had changed such that, you know, parliamentary transition would actually be possible, that it was no longer necessary to dismantle the bourgeois state or to somehow do that from within parliament, which had never been possible previously. But the reality is, no, it wasn't, and it never has been. So even at the peak of the 20th century, the strength of the socialist camp, when the international communist movement was at its height, it was still insufficient for that. So whether that will be the case when socialism has conquered 89% of the world and you know there's just a tiny bit left and the capitalists are just sort of giving up and surrendering, maybe then, but definitely not at this point. And they probably should have known that. I mean, this piece, like a lot of communist declarations, is a kind of inspiring agitprop, even as it's trying to report objective circumstances, it's trying to report them in the most optimistic light possible, sometimes really overextending with that. But while it's important to present things in the light of revolutionary optimism, it's also important not to give people false hopes about roads to socialism that aren't going to work. So again, a couple of Hoja pieces we put up reject the revisionist theses, also the modern revisionists, have addressed this point in particular, and also the bit about the Khrushchevites being more open towards conciliation with the right-wing social democratic parties. Hoja wrote quite a bit uh, attacking that particular topic. Um, those have already gone into some of the criticism, and then again, we'll be following this piece in the coming days with a couple of other pieces that expand and elaborate on this. There are also some longer Hoja pieces, as well as other pieces out of China from the Sino-Soviet split, um, we're not going to do them right now. I understand there's another channel that is working on a longer audiobook of the Khrushchevites, so we look forward to that coming out. All right, let's continue this uh, list here. So, transform parliament from an instrument serving the class interests of the bourgeoisie into an instrument serving the working people. Launch an extra parliamentary mass struggle. Smash the resistance of the reactionary forces and create the necessary conditions for peaceful realization of the socialist revolution. All this will be possible only by broad and ceaseless development of the class struggle of the workers, peasant masses, and the urban middle strata against big monopoly capital, against reaction, for profound social reforms, for peace and socialism. In the event of the exploiting classes resorting to violence against people, you can pretty much count on that, the possibility of non-peaceful transition to socialism should be borne in mind. Leninism teaches, and experience confirms, that the ruling classes never relinquish power voluntarily. Ha! Huh, what were you just talking about? In this case, the degree of bitterness and the forms of the class struggle will depend not so much on the proletariat as on the resistance put up by the reactionary circles to the will of the overwhelming majority of the people, on these circles using force at one or another stage of the struggle for socialism. The actual possibility of the one or the other way of transition to socialism in each individual country depends on the concrete historical conditions. In our time, when communism is not only the most advanced doctrine but an actually existing social system, which has proved its superiority over capitalism, conditions are particularly favorable for expanding the influence of the communist parties, vigorously exposing anti-communism, a slogan under which the capitalist class wages its struggle against the proletariat, and winning the broadest sections of the working masses for communist ideas. Anti-communism arose at the dawn of the working class movement as the principal ideological weapon of the capitalist class in its struggle against the proletariat and Marxist ideology. As the class struggle grew in intensity, particularly with the formation of the world socialist system, anti-communism became more vicious and refined. Anti-communism, which is indicative of a deep ideological crisis in and extreme decline of bourgeois ideology, resorts to monstrous distortions of Marxist doctrine and crude slander against the socialist social system, presents communist policies and objectives in a false light, and carries on a witch hunt against the democratic peaceful forces and organizations. To effectively defend the interests of the working people, 
maintain peace, and realize the socialist ideals of the working class. It is indispensable to wage a resolute struggle against anti-communism, that poisoned weapon which the bourgeoisie uses to fence off the masses from socialism. Comment, I think that's a great mental image. That's exactly how I think of what happened with the U.S. population, which is the primary audience of this channel. We, including me as I was growing up before I found my way into all these readings and, and these studies and connecting with the history of the international communist movement, were kept in this pen just completely in the dark and basically just fed fascist propaganda all day long. And uh, we never really get to see what did the communists really say? What did they really do in their countries, etc.? So yeah, absolutely, it's used to fence off the masses from socialism. Continuing, a greater effort is required in explaining the ideas of socialism to the masses, to educate the working people in a revolutionary spirit, to develop their revolutionary class consciousness, and to show all working people the superiority of socialist society by referring to the experience of the countries of the world socialist system, demonstrating in concrete form the benefits which socialism will actually give to workers, peasants, and other sections of the population in each country. Communism assures people freedom from fear of war, lasting peace, freedom from imperialist oppression and exploitation, from unemployment and poverty, general well-being and a high standard of living, freedom from fear of economic crisis, a rapid growth of the productive forces for the benefit of society as a whole, freedom from the tyranny of the money bag over the individual, all-round spiritual development of man, the fullest development of talent, unlimited scientific and cultural progress of society. All the sections of the population, with the exception of a handful of exploiters, stand to gain from the victory of the new social system. And this must be brought home to millions of people in the capitalist countries. Section 6. The world communist movement has become the most influential political force of our time, a most important factor in social progress, as it fights bitterly against imperialist reaction, for the interests of the working class and all working people, for peace, national independence, democracy, and socialism, the communist movement is already making steady headway, is becoming consolidated and steeled. There are now communist parties active in 87 countries of the world. Their total membership exceeds 36 million. This is a signal victory for Marxism-Leninism and a tremendous achievement of the working class. Like-minded Marxists are rallying in the countries which have shaken off colonial tyranny and taken the path of independent development. Communist parties consider it their internationalist duty to promote friendship and solidarity between the working class of their countries and the working class movement of the countries which have won their freedom in the common struggle against imperialism. The growth of the communist parties and their organizational consolidation, the victories of the communist parties in a number of countries in the struggle against deviations, Elimination of the harmful consequences of the personality cult. Comment. Sounds like another echo of the secret speech given by Khrushchev against Stalin. Continuing. The greater influence of the world communist movement opened new prospects for the successful accomplishment of the tasks facing the communist parties. Marxist-Leninist parties regard it as an inviolable law of their activity, steadfastly to observe the Leninist standards of party life in keeping with the principle of democratic centralism. They consider that they must cherish party unity like the apple of their eye, strictly to adhere to the principle of party democracy and collective leadership, for they attach, in keeping with the organizational principles of Leninism, great importance to the role of the leading party bodies in the life of the party, to work indefatigably for the strengthening of their bonds with the party membership and with the broad masses of the working people, not to allow the personality cult, which shackles creative thought and initiative of communists, vigorously to promote the activity of communists and to encourage criticism and self-criticism in their ranks. The communist parties have ideologically defeated the revisionists in their ranks who sought to divert them from the Marxist-Leninist path. Comment, although this is definitely papering over the brewing China-USSR rift. Continuing, each communist party and the international communist movement as a whole have become still stronger, ideologically and organizationally, in the struggle against revisionism right-wing opportunism. The communist parties have unanimously condemned the Yugoslav variety of international opportunism, a variety of modern revisionist, quote, theories in concentrated form. After betraying Marxism-Leninism, which they termed obsolete, the leaders of the League of Communists of Yugoslavia opposed their anti-Leninist revisionist program to the Declaration of 1957. They set the League of Communists of Yugoslavia against the international communist movement as a whole, 
severed their country from the socialist camp, made it dependent on so-called aid from U.S. and other imperialists, and thereby exposed the Yugoslav people to the danger of losing the revolutionary gains achieved through a heroic struggle. The Yugoslav revisionists carry on subversive work against the socialist camp and the world communist movement. Under the pretext of an extra bloc policy, they engage in activities which prejudice the unity of all the peace-loving forces and countries. Further exposure of the leaders of Yugoslav revisionists and active struggle to safeguard the communist movement and the working class movement from the anti-Leninist ideas of the Yugoslav revisionists remains an essential task of the Marxist-Leninist parties. Comment. So this is one of the points that Hoja was really emphatic about in his speech to this 1960 meeting, Reject the Revisionist Theses. There's a very long title, but that's the beginning of it. He emphasized again and again that Yugoslavia had posed a danger to the national security of Albania in a number of different ways and took the Soviets to task for their seeming rapprochement with the Yugoslav revisionists. So happy to see that those points got entered into this document here, continuing. The practical struggles of the working class and the entire course of social development have furnished a brilliant new proof of the great all-conquering power and vitality of Marxism-Leninism and have thoroughly refuted all modern revisionist, quote, theories. The further development of the communist and working class movement calls, as stated in the Moscow Declaration of 1957, for continuing a determined struggle on two fronts, against revisionism, which remains the main danger, and against dogmatism and sectarianism. Revisionism, right-wing opportunism, which mirrors the bourgeois ideology in theory and practice, distorts Marxism-Leninism, emasculates its revolutionary essence, and thereby paralyzes the revolutionary will of the working class, disarms and demobilizes the workers, the masses of the working people, in their struggle against oppression by imperialists and exploiters, for peace, democracy, and national liberation, for the triumph of socialism. Dogmatism and sectarianism in theory and practice can also become the main danger at some stage of development of individual parties unless combated unrelentingly. They rob revolutionary parties of the ability to develop Marxism-Leninism through scientific analysis and apply it creatively according to the specific conditions. They isolate communists from the broad masses of the working people, doom them to passive expectation or to leftist, adventurist actions in the revolutionary struggle. They prevent them from making a timely and correct estimate of the changing situation and of new experience, using all opportunities to bring about the victory of the working class and all democratic forces in the struggle against imperialism, reaction, and war danger, and thereby prevent the peoples from achieving victory in their just struggle. At a time when imperialist reaction is joining forces to fight communism, it is particularly imperative vigorously to consolidate the world communist movement. Unity and solidarity redouble the strength of our movement and provide a reliable guarantee that the great cause of communism will make victorious progress and all enemy attacks will be effectively repelled. Communists throughout the world are united by the great doctrine of Marxism-Leninism and by a joint struggle for its realization. The interests of the communist movement require solidarity and adherence by every communist party to the estimates and conclusions concerning the common tasks in the struggle against imperialism and for peace, democracy, and socialism, jointly reached by the fraternal parties at their meetings. The interests of the struggle for the working class cause demand ever closer scrutiny of the ranks of each communist party and of the great army of communists of all countries. They demand of them unity of will and action. It is the supreme internationalist duty of every Marxist-Leninist party to work continuously for greater unity in the world communist movement. A resolute defense of the unity of the world communist movement on the principles of Marxism-Leninism and proletarian internationalism, and the prevention of any actions which may undermine that unity, are a necessary condition for victory in the struggle for national independence, democracy, and peace, for the successful accomplishment of the tasks of the socialist revolution and of the building of socialism and communism. Violation of these principles would impair the forces of communism. All the Marxist-Leninist parties are independent and have equal rights. They shape their policies according to the specific conditions in their respective countries and in keeping with Marxist-Leninist principles, and they support each other. The success of the working class cause in any country is unthinkable without the internationalist solidarity of all Marxist-Leninist parties. Every party is responsible to the working class, to the working people of its country, to the international working class, and to the communist movement as a whole. 
The Communist and Workers' Parties hold meetings whenever necessary to discuss urgent problems, to exchange experience, to acquaint themselves with each other's views and positions, to work out common views through consultation and coordinate joint actions in the struggle for common goals. Whenever a party wants to clear up questions relating to the activities of another fraternal party, its leadership approaches the leadership of the party concerned. If necessary, they hold meetings and consultations. The experience and results of the meetings of representatives of the Communist parties held in recent years, particularly the results of the two major meetings, that of November 1957 and this meeting, show that in present-day conditions, such meetings are an effective form of exchanging views and experience, enriching Marxist-Leninist theory by collective effort and elaborating a common attitude in the struggle for common objectives. The Communist and Workers' Parties unanimously declare that the Communist Party of the Soviet Union has been and remains the universally recognized vanguard of the world communist movement, being the most experienced and steeled contingent of the international communist movement. The experience which the CPSU has gained in the struggle for the victory of the working class, in socialist construction, and in the full-scale construction of communism is of fundamental significance for the whole of the world communist movement. The example of the CPSU and its fraternal solidarity inspire all the communist parties in their struggle for peace and socialism and represent the revolutionary principles of proletarian internationalism applied in practice. The historic decisions of the 20th Congress of the CPSU are not only of great importance for the CPSU and communist construction in the USSR, but have initiated a new stage in the world communist movement and have promoted its development on the basis of Marxism-Leninism. Comment. So it's precisely that 20th Congress of the CPSU that Hoja wrote that piece about. Its full title being Reject the Revisionist Theses of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Anti-Marxist Stand of Khrushchev's Group Uphold Marxism-Leninism. Continuing, all communist and workers' parties contribute to the development of the great theory of Marxism-Leninism. Mutual assistance and support in relations between all the fraternal Marxist-Leninist parties embody the revolutionary principles of proletarian internationalism applied in practice. Ideological issues are of special significance today. The exploiting class tries to counteract the achievements of socialism by exerting ever greater ideological pressure on the masses as it seeks to keep them in spiritual bondage to bourgeois ideology. Communists regard it as their task to launch a determined offensive on the ideological front, to work for the emancipation of the masses from the spiritual bondage of all types and forms of bourgeois ideology, including the pernicious influence of reformism, to disseminate among the masses progressive ideas making for social advancement, the ideas of democratic freedom, the ideology of scientific socialism. Historical experience shows that the survivals of capitalism in the minds of people persist over a long period, even after the establishment of a socialist system. Comment. This is what Marx was saying, that the new socialist society could be expected to bear the hallmarks of the capitalist society which gave birth to it. It's only after a fairly long time and multiple generations that it's able to do things in a new way and to overwrite those old habits and those old ways of thought with new ways. Continuing, this demands extensive work by the party on the communist education of the masses and a better Marxist-Leninist training and stealing of party and government cadres. Marxism-Leninism is a great integral revolutionary doctrine, the lodestar of the working class and working people of the whole world at all stages of their great battle for peace, freedom, and a better life, for the establishment of the most just society, communism. It's great creative, revolutionizing power lies in its unbreakable link with life, in its continuous enrichment through a comprehensive analysis of reality. On the basis of Marxism-Leninism, the community of socialist countries and the international communist, working class, and liberation movements have achieved great historic success, and it is only on its basis that all the tasks facing the communist and workers' parties can be effectively accomplished. The meeting sees the further consolidation of the communist parties on the basis of Marxism-Leninism, of proletarian internationalism, as a primary condition for the unification of all working class, democratic, and progressive forces, as a guarantee of new victories in the great struggle waged by the world communist and working class movement for a happy future for the whole of mankind, for the triumph of the cause of peace and socialism. And that is the end of the statement of 81 Communist and Workers' Parties meeting in Moscow, USSR, 1960.
So here on the channel, we are about to enter the fourth year of doing this thing that we're doing here. In the earlier years, we were reading a lot more foundational things from Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and it's now that we're going more into the mid and later 20th century history of the international communist movement, where the pieces that Lenin and Marx and Engels in particular were talking about as principles that they would still have in the future to put into practice and see how they actually worked. And I mentioned Stalin also. Stalin was also around before the revolution and obviously active with the Bolsheviks then, but then also helped to oversee the construction of the first few decades of the world's foremost socialist system. So it's here that the rubber starts to really meet the road as far as, well, it's one thing when we are all oppressed by capitalism and there's no proletarian state yet, and then it's different when you begin socialist construction and you're able to fight back in new ways. You've actually crossed the finish line of capitalism, at least in some places around the world, and you're moving on to completely new territory, which has only been theorized about previously. So in 20th century socialism, after the revolutions were underway, there were tremendous victories as far as social revolutions in a number of countries and many more national liberation movements as well, which this document covered at length, talking about their then current theories of people's democracy and national liberation. And there were also failures, both in terms of revolutions that didn't get off the ground. However, I say failures, but actually we did learn a lot from these experiments, even though they didn't go all the way to successful completion. Still a source of information about how socialist revolution works and what are some of the laws and lessons that can be gleaned from things that didn't go the way of the proletariat in that situation. That's one form of failure or loss, but there was also the loss of countries that were thought to have really secured and shored up socialist construction for good, that it was unassailable as is actually mentioned in this piece. Well, that wasn't the case. And of course today, capitalism is still around. Capitalism still has to be defeated. This movement has to be worked back up again. We can't just rely on the kinds of nationalist, um, inter-imperialist struggle that's going on right now that has some characteristics of emerging markets or more recently developing markets versus more established countries in the capitalist sphere. That's not really a substitute for actual class struggle because even in this context, which talked about national liberation extensively, it was understood there that the national bourgeoisie is unreliable, unstable vacillating. Lenin talked about this as well, and it's true. You can see it throughout history. They can be, to a certain extent, relied upon as an anti-feudal and anti-imperialist force. However, being that they have very narrow class interests in the end, you have to really watch them that they don't betray the rest of the nation, that is, all the other majoritarian classes in the nation, in favor of some kind of alliance with feudal forces, with imperialist forces, as they're inclined to do. That's why the proletariat needs to be deeply involved with and ideally at the head of these national liberation coalitions. It says in this document how things were different under the umbrella and the protection of the international socialist camp. I think that that is true because they were much more able then to advance proletarian interests and push proletarians to the head of the line as far as the fight for freedom so that the nationalist bourgeoisie wasn't able to get a leg up and betray the overall interests of the country as often as they would have without that international socialist camp being there to help the proletariat to keep things headed in the right direction. Now, that did work very well to a point. However, something happened along the way. There was the Sino-Soviet split in the 50s into the 60s. There were allegations against the USSR of its being social imperialist, that is, socialist in name, while some of its policies actually were more perhaps imperialist in nature. And then in the late 70s, China begins its opening up and market reforms as part of a strategy of teaming with the US against the USSR. Then the USSR doing other kinds of liberalization of its own, which were completely fatal. And now we've been here in this place for over 30 years now, post-USSR, wondering how do we get this thing back on track? Because capitalism is still here, and we still need to get rid of it, and we need to complete development 
beyond capitalism, which means we have to do a lot of this process over again, but do it better this time. The fate of the planet quite literally depends on it because capitalism can't solve climate change. Capitalism can't solve pandemics in a way that's actually effective, humane, and doesn't really amount to just kind of sweeping the problem under the rug. If it had solutions to those things, it would do them. It's in its interest to do them. It can't do them. That it hasn't done them means that it can't do them. And I mentioned climate change. That is actually just one prong of an overall ecological environmental crisis. It's a particularly salient point of that crisis, but there's so many other things. The microplastics, the forever chemicals, which can cause birth defects now being detected in rainwater all over the world. There's a finite amount of time that these problems can persist without causing catastrophic damage. So anyway, capitalism still remains to be done away with. There was significant progress on this front, and then a lot of that has been lost to date. However, we didn't lose the theory, we didn't lose the history. What we lost was the implementation, and we can build that back up. But part of that process is understanding what went wrong. So that's why we're looking at things like the criticisms of the USSR in the post-Stalin years, because indeed something major did go wrong here. And it behooves us to find out what that was and to come up with clear analysis that can help the parties and movement of today to chart a path forward. So anyway, about the document itself, this was pretty long, like an hour and a half. It covered a wide variety of topics. I am done with my comments here as far as specifics, but for you out there listening in the audience, I am interested to hear your thoughts, especially if you have studied a fair amount of theory at this point. What do you think about what was in this document? Was it correct? Was it incorrect? Why or why not? Support your point with the best quality evidence and clear reasoning that you can, and I'm happy to facilitate that discussion. Otherwise, that's it for now. Thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialismforall or buymeacoffee.com slash socialismforall. You can either make a recurring or a one-time donation. Every contribution is encouraging. They're also materially helpful for me to be able to spend as much time on this channel as I do. I have had kind of a busy stretch in my personal life recently, but I should be able to catch up on some of the things that I've been wanting to post in the next few weeks, so look for that. Remember that engagement counts, like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, even if it's thanks or good video. All of that helps YouTube to boost this channel and boost this video and helps other people to stumble across this content. We want to keep expanding that discussion. It's been going well. Please help us do that with your engagement, whether you're a patron or not. Finally, organization matters. You can do education and agitation online, but you've got to get involved in the real world struggle. The United States does not have a well-developed left, but there usually are some kinds of left networks in different cities or different regions. It's important to stay in touch with those. A lot of them won't be Marxist. Some of them will even be anti-Marxist at first. However, as more of us enter the ranks of real world struggle, having done this study, we can raise the bar and turn those networks into something actually useful for the world communist and working class movement, for a happy future of the whole of mankind, for the cause of the triumph of peace and socialism. Thanks again. We'll see you in the next video.